Hello, my name is Nicholas Taliaferro Abraham, and today I will be presenting my senior project, which is a hypothetical play based on the work of Mike Poulton on the plays um, Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies. First off, to explain what these two plays are, it is melded into one talking about the fixer and advisor to King Henry VIII of England. He helped mainly get uh, King Henry a divorce and in his wake also um, charged many um, innocent people to death in regards to infidelity by the king's queen. Next slide, please. So the original play takes place in the 17th century, but in, for me, I wanted to bring the play into a modern context. And the reason for that dealt with recent events. On January 6th, when we had the, um, in regards to President Biden and making sure that he would become president and the riots, something came into my head in thinking about Bring Up the Bodies and Wolf Hall in regards to the relationship between um, King Henry VIII and, Tom, and his advisor, Thomas Cromwell. Uh, Cromwell had to fabricate a lot of facts in order to get a divorce for King Henry VIII. And so when I looked at uh, former President Donald Trump and Giuliani, I saw that same relationship just in a different century. So I wanted to see if I could use the same play by Mike Poulton, both plays, and bring it into a modern context, but not in the 21st century, but in the 20th century. The next slide, please. So, the design and research of it. Uh, next slide, please. Why, uh, what is the basic idea of taking a Tudor's um, drama and bringing it into the 20th century? Next slide, please. It's very simple. Turn the Tudors into the Windsor family which is the closest thing that we have to what the Tudors would be, except I wanted to keep a few design characteristics. Next slide, please. In order to keep it as a Tudor uh, type of show, I wanted to keep a ruggedness, which meant that they would not, uh, not everyone be necessarily clean cut as we would in the 20th century, but to have, um, particularly the men, have facial hair and not clean. And also, instead of a um, monochromatic uh, uh, type of palette for the colors, which I usually associate with um, Great Britain in the 1930s and 1940s, I wanted to keep it warm. And so everything that um, is in, the, in this Tudor drama is very colorful. It's just in different um, silhouettes based on 1930s and 1940s forms. Next slide, please. So, now we talk about who are the main um, players of the play, meaning who are the main characters. Next slide, please. In designing the, uh, the main character, uh, Thomas Cromwell, I was thinking in regards to um, a spy drama, and I kept thinking of a, um, a famous uh, miniseries from the 1970s, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, starring uh, Sir Alec Guinness. And when I started to kind of craft what uh, Thomas would look like, I also looked at other archetypes that um, fit that type of mold, including um, uh, Gary Oldman, who was also um, a, a George Smiley in the, app, in the um, updated version that was in 2013 of Tinker, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. He has a very studious look. He has glasses. He looks very smart in his, in his, in his dress. And so I found a silhouette that I liked, and I completely took that and put it on paper. Next slide, please. So uh, we go into the, the House of Cromwell, which uh, gives the basic idea of what and who he is. And surprisingly, um, his surname does, in fact, um, talk about who he is. He is ever-changing. That's what the name uh, Cromwell means. Next slide, please. So here we have the two, art, two of my renderings, one in black and white, one in color. 
I would have loved to have done everything in color, but over 42 plus characters, that's a very long list, and I had to save time. So we have one idea, which is the complete pencil sketch, and then towards its right, we have what Thomas Cromwell becomes towards the end of the play. He's no longer wearing um, a single breasted suit. He's completely, uh, has a pinstripe, um, double breasted. He shows that he has changed in regards to his social status from being a commoner to then being the second right-hand man to King Henry VIII. Next slide, please. And then the original idea was to create a fully functional um, practice garment made out of muslin. But because of uh, time constraints and also I ran out of fabric, I decided to do a technical flat. So I did um, two sides of both the, jack the jacket, the pant, and then the shirt. Next slide, please. The shirt uh, was, you know, very simple because I didn't necessarily know what it would look like, except only from what I um, had imagined. So it was a very simple sketch. First doing a pencil drawing, and then on a light box, um, tracing it with pen, very carefully. <laughs> Next slide, please. Then we get to the man himself who um, Thomas works for, who is uh, Henry VIII, and his first wife, uh, Catherine of Aragon. And as a tidbit, um, the word tutor means God's gift. So that gave me a very clear idea of what uh, Henry needed to look like. And then uh, with uh, Catherine of Aragon, which stands for her name, means stronghold or castle. So two um, opposing ideas in regards to who they are, but was fantastic in regards to creating a uh, color palette. Next slide, please. So for Henry VIII, and for many all the other characters, it's very simple. What would the Tudors look like in a 20th century context? And to me, the Tudors are in fact people that are obsessed with power, fame, and the, um, to be loved by the people. What is the greatest context that we could say in regards to vanity in the 1930s and 40s? Hollywood. So I chose specific um, actors that I felt each uh, character from the play would gravitate to. And for Henry VIII, it was Clark Gable and also a bit of maybe uh, Daniel Craig. <laughs> Next slide, please. So in order to show kind of the passing of time, because the play takes place within a 30 year period, I needed to show Henry what he looked like before um, he had his second wife, to then what we know him as today, as you know, a very um, overweight man. So he's dressed in a um, hunting outfit, uh, and then we see him in a more relaxed, not necessarily fitted um, type of clothing, and also very colorful. I wanted, once again, for all the Tudor characters to be in some form of color, unless they are not necessarily um, that important. Next slide, please. Then we get to Catherine of Aragon, who is a very pious woman. She's extremely religious. I did not want to put any type of attention to her, so I made her completely dressed in black. Next slide, please. She would wear primarily dark colors, maybe with just a hint of purple, but primarily black, uh, particularly um, a type of velvet, which I found. And I think, um, told what I wanted to have the character show. Next slide, please. Then we get to the House of Boleyn, which uh, stands for the foundation. That is the exact translation for the name Boleyn. Next slide, please. Except in regards to the House of Boleyn, instead of creating a foundation, it is the exact opposite. It's bringing the house down. So I thought, what is what is the opposite in regards to uh, destroying a foundation? It's not water, it's fire. So I wanted the entire Boleyn family to be associated with something that was vibrant in regards to fire in different stages of uh, combustion. And also uh, choosing the actors that I thought might associate with them. We have Ava Gardner that I thought of in regards to Anne Boleyn, and then um, Joe Cole who would have been um, George Boleyn, 
who eventually uh, died. Next. Next slide, please. So I put Anne Boleyn entirely in red. So every uh, time that you see her, she's in some type of uh, different shade of red, which also I think is a form of martyrdom, um, martyrdom for her. Next slide, please. We then have George Boleyn, who starts in a um, kind of neutral color. I put him in a charcoal color, but then as we go more into the play, he kind of mirrors um, King Henry VIII in regards to being a bit more flamboyant in his clothing. So I put him in a double-breasted suit, and that would be probably midnight um, blue that I thought of. Next slide, please. Then we have Mary Boleyn, who is so instrumental in both plays, but is only seen in one scene, but is mentioned six times. So I thought it needs to be a dress that has some type of flair, but does not necessarily um, is the same as Anne Boleyn. So then we, uh, I gave her a, um, a green emerald dress. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So then we get into um, Henry's third wife, Jane Seymour, who is also instrumental in the play, but is only seen a few times. So I only wanted one dress for her that I would design. Next slide, please. It was a combination of knitwear and silk that would be completely white because the name Seymour means lake or pond. So it had to be a type of fluid fabric. So I chose silk for her. Next slide, please. Then we go into Thomas More, who was um, Henry's first advisor before Thomas Cromwell took over. Next slide, please. Similar to Catherine of Aragon, he is also a very pious man. He believes that everything he does is justified. And so he is in a way like a priest, but is not a priest at all. So I wanted him to be completely dressed in black. Next slide, please. So I have him beginning really with a simple color palette. But even as he changes costume one more time, he is still always in black. The only difference is that he changes from a single-breasted to double-breasted suit. Next slide, please. Now, finally, the secondary characters. Those that are part of the play but are not as important in regards to the um, pushing the play forward. Next slide, please. We then have the man that could not give Henry the divorce, uh, Cardinal Wolsey, which I gave him just his clerical outfit, next slide please, which is entirely um, of watermark, red, and then lace. Next slide please. Then we get to Harry Percy, one of the accused that had an affair with Anne Boleyn. I just needed to put a, um, a face to the actor, a, a face to the character, so I chose um, Donhill Gleason, son of Brendan Gleason. Next slide please. He starts as in a kind of dandy suit, which is uh, kind of a, a, a twill or woven, and then he starts in a very dark, um, and then he ends in a dark outfit because he becomes a drunk in regards to having to put his feelings aside in order to be in the good graces of the king. Next slide, please. Then we get to Thomas Howard, uncle to Anne Boleyn, who also put the final nail in the coffin for her uh, by the time she died. Um, the character is, in fact, 60 years old. So I needed uh, to characterize how would that look like for this gentleman, and also because he comes from a generation before Henry. So um, I thought of Sean Connery, because the character is also a bully, and Sean could always play a bully. Next slide, please. So the idea was that um, Sean's character um, was from the 1920s, so his outfit would be a bit different, and so it was far more tailored. But then I created another design that would allow him to be closer to the times of the 1930s and 40s. Next slide, please. Then we have Charles Brandon, who is Henry's brother-in-law. Next slide, please. He was uh, what was called a mocker, which is technically just um, a border um, patrolman of sorts who um, looked after the border between England and Wales. And I felt that in 20th century terms, well, he probably had um, went through all of the islands of the United Kingdom. So I thought I'd put him in a kilt. 
So I gave him two ideas of a kilt, one in red tartan, which is just uh, the material used for a kilt, and then a black gray tartan, which is meant for hunting. Because in this play, there's a lot of game hunting in this play. Next slide, please. Then we get to France, uh, Francis Weston, who is kind of a young archetype of Henry VIII. He, um, Henry likes him and keeps him in his good graces. Next slide, please. I put him in a type of cream um, blazer with then black pants. He's technically always looking for a party, and he always dresses um, very well. So I wanted him to be in the best types of silk, best types of wool that we could put on the actor. Next slide, please. We then have Henry Norris, also uh, another kind of border patrolman who also um, was in the good graces of Henry VIII. Next slide, please. I wanted him to be um, a character that was given the title of being in a position of status, but didn't necessarily know what to do with it. So he's pretending to be a man for which he's not. He likes to be out, he likes to be out on the field, yet he's dressed in the most luxurious types of um, material. So I put him in camel hair, um, uh, yeah, a camel hair uh, material. So it's very thick. He also wears wool vests. He's always wearing some type of three-piece suit. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And then this is one of um, Henry's other um, cohorts, who is in a way, kind of a, um, he, he likes to be in the bar. He likes to, he likes to uh, have games around. So I thought that I would have him in a one outfit without a, um, a blazer and one without one to just show that he's, he prefers to be very relaxed, but he has a very interesting color palette of greens, purple, and navy blue. Next slide, please. And then we have Mark Sweeten, who was a starving artist, also one of the accused of being with Anne Boleyn. Next slide, please. In the play, he was originally um, playing a different instrument, but in 20th century terms, I thought, why not make it a violin? So I made him a violinist. I kind of looked at Joshua Bell, the famous violinist, as a kind of guide of what um, he, would, he might look like. And also because he's not from the aristocracy, he doesn't wear any type of luxurious um, material. So it's very, he's not meant to draw any type of attention. Next slide, please. And that uh, concludes my part of the presentation. I would like to thank uh, Professor um, Douse for helping me create this very big project and minimize it to really the essentials. I also want to um, thank um, Karen Jacobs, who has guided me since I've gotten uh, to Southern California and on to Dominguez Hills and really um, sharpened my skills in regards to design. I also like to thank um, Tatiana Gresner, who is my supervisor at um, my community college, who also helped me in regards to understanding what a costume designer does and our, our place and our importance in regards to um, what we do. And lastly, my former um, department head of the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, um, Janice Paredes, with really out here, I, I would not be standing. And I, I thank you. I thank you for that, Janice, for getting me here. Even though I, I couldn't um, stay with the, the school, you told me one thing, to keep doing this. To keep doing this, because one day you're going to find your place where I am now. I didn't know if you were just trying to say to find a different profession, but I took that to heart. And for 12 years, I have kept that with me. So thank you. I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving me that bit of encouragement. Mm. Yeah, thank you.
Hi, my name is Lauren Jordan, and for my senior project, I had the pleasure of doing the headpieces and masks for the show, Mr. Burns, a post-electric play. So the first uh, piece that I'm going to be talking about is the headpiece. Um, so my mentor was Katie Douse, and she came up with all the designs and all of the headpieces that were made for the show. So I worked really closely with her, and I went to her for so much guidance. She helped me a lot through the whole process. And also the director of the play was Naomi Buckley. So for the first um, slide here, we have the headpiece, which is for um, Sideshow Bob. And the, uh, the design she came up with, and also she also showed me a video which explained the whole process of creating the headpiece, so that helped me out a lot. So for this headpiece, we have, um, there was a few things I went through making the headpiece. Next slide, please. Okay, so for this, um, for this headpiece, it was a red baseball cap. And what we did was we cut the brim of the hat off and we attached it to the back. And then also um, what was explained in the video was that you had to create like a spiral design with the pool noodles. And so that took a few tries before I actually like got it correctly, but it was a lot of fun. And then after that, um, I attached the uh, pool and noodles around the hat, and that's what created the big uh, hair for Sideshow Bob. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so for the mask designs, um, Katie came up with the um, designs for how she wanted all of the characters to look, and there were several characters besides the Simpsons family. Um, so we kind of divided which masks we were gonna do because there were so many, so we kind of, this was a collaborative process so she asked me which masks I would like to create. And so I decided that because it's The Simpsons, I wanted to make The Simpsons family um, masks for this, um, for this show. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about the process that I went through with making this. This is something I've never ever done before. So I was really nervous. So I kind of like put off making them at first because I didn't want to mess it up because I knew it was so important to get them correctly because this is something that the audience is going to see and they're going to know who the characters are. And so if the masks look, they don't look anything like the characters, I was afraid that, that it was not going to, they were not going to be able to tell who was who in the show. So it took me a while to kind of prep myself to making them so that I can do a good job. So for this, um, so for the design, we had, um, we used like a Jason ski mask. And then on top of the mask, we put clay to kind of create the, the shape and the design of what the masks were gonna look like. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the main material that I used for the mask design was Warbla. And I guess a lot of people use it for cosplay and different kind of um, uh, costuming, um, headpieces or they use it for different designs for their costumes. So this is a material I had never worked with before, so I was really hesitant to kind of try it, but Katie, she helped me so much because she went through the process herself, so she gave me a lot of instructions on how to go, to go about doing it. So she went step by step and she told me exactly what I needed to do. And this is a thermal plastic, so the, the plastic is molded through heat. So what we did was we put the material over the clay um, molding that I made, and then I heated it up and I placed it over to kind of create the shape of it. And then once it cooled down, I removed it from the actual mold, and then I was able to cut it and shape it into the design. So that's what you can see here is the whole step-by-step -step process that I went through in creating the, this is actually the chorus mask, which four characters in the beginning of the third act of the show, they wear this mask. So it's kind of like a basic, simple design, and they all had the same one. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so next, what we had to do as far as the eyes was um, to kind of create like a, like a interesting look. She wanted to use ornaments, so we had clear ornaments put into the eyeballs to create like kind of a unique design. And for this, um, this picture here, I had to heat up the mask, place the ornaments inside to kind of create the mold. And once it had cooled down, then I removed 
the ornaments and I cut the shape out so that um, so that you'll be able to see through them. And then after that, I put a primer over the mask before I painted them. Next slide. Okay, so here is the masks they're painted. And um, besides the chorus masks, I also created the Simpsons mask and each of them had a different shape to them. So the middle one is gonna be like Homer's base mask before I added to it. And then I also have um, Bart Simpson's mask as well. So each of the main base, base masks here that went over the face, they were painted gold. And then I added a clear warbler material over the top to create the bigger um, designs and shapes of the mask. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna go through and um, I took photos of each of the masks that I made. So this is the, um, the chorus mask. And there were about four of them, and they were all the same. They looked exactly the same for the characters in the show. Um, so it was just the simple shape. They're painted gold, and then they have um, the eye shape as well. Next slide. Okay, this is, um, this is Homer Simpson's mask. So for his, uh, for his base mask, it's gold and it's pointed here. And then on top of it, I used a, um, it's the same material as the base mask, but it's clear. So I was able to paint it. And what we decided, um, it took a while to, for, for us to figure out what we were gonna actually paint it because we wanted to have that translucent look to it. So Katie came up with the idea of using Sharpie. So with the Sharpie, you're able to get that color, but also you can see through it. So it gave like that translucent look. and. The idea behind her designs was that she wanted it to look kind of like stained glass. So that's what you can see here is the design, but also around the edges, it's black, so it creates the, the stained glass look. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and this is, um, this is Marge Simpson's mask, and hers, she has, um, along with working with her, I was able to kind of come to her for ideas as far as like making like a small changes. So originally it had a different, a little bit of a different shape. And I had discussed with her how we can kind of change it to make it look a little bit different. And I decided that I wanted it to have more of a flowy look. So I was able to kind of work with her and collaborate with her on how we can kind of work with the design, but also make small changes to it. So she allowed me to do that for, for this particular mask. Next slide. This is, um, this is Bart Simpson's mask. And for his, um, he has like a pointed look with the base mask. And then on top we have the clear warbler. And um, when you heat the, the warble material, you're able to shape it in whatever shape you want so for his the top of it kind of folds over and it creates like that look where it peeks out so that was like fun to kind of shape it and then you're able to like make the different designs with it as well and then it has the black outlining it um, next slide and then this is lisa simpson's mask and hers was um hers took a little bit more time only because it has a lot of intricate details and the shape of it it comes out further than I think the rest of the mask. So hers took a little bit more time. So I spent a lot more time on hers just because I'm kind of a perfectionist. So I wanted to make sure they all looked great, even up close, even from far away, it's not really as noticeable, but for me even to have it, you know, it, it just looks so like great, like up close. I wanted to make sure that they looked amazing. And then um, I used black paint to create the detail um, for the stained glass look. Next slide. Um, sorry, this is the last slide. Um, so again, I had so much fun creating this because this was kind of like a mesh between creating props and costumes. So that's kind of what I was able to use my experience, which I'm still learning a lot about making props and also costuming. So this was kind of a way to mesh them together. And I kind of found like my passion and what I really enjoy doing. So I had so much fun making this and it kind of brought so much life to the show and um, I had a lot of fun so thank you.
Hello, my name is Nick Castillo, and today I will, be present, I will be presenting the role of a stage manager. So how I got started was actually going through uh, auditions. I was auditioning for a uh, musical that we were doing at my community college. We were doing Hairspray. I had gotten cut, uh, unfortunately, after the dance callback, but I still wanted to be a part of it because I, it was such a compelling show for me to want to be a part of. And so I ended up shadowing the assistant stage manager. And somewhere along the lines, the original assistant stage manager had quit. And because I had been there the entire time, I got bumped up and I ended up becoming an assistant stage manager for that show. I had zero theater experience going into that show. And I learned so much <laughs> during that one show in particular. And that's kind of how my whole stage management journey started. Um, so right here on this first slide, as you can see, um, this is how I ran my audition sheet. There was a form that I had uh, the actors fill out once I started doing my own shows. And from there, I went to um, my own spreadsheet and I would highlight um, in green who got the callback. If they were in blue, they did not get a callback and so on and so forth. Um, and then on the next slide, um, it was kind of a little uh, interesting story about my time being an assistant stage manager for my first production. So in the first picture, you could see me in a hat and a um, one of those long uh, jackets because I had to go on for an actor because they were uh, about 20 to 30 minutes late from the start of the show. Um, so our, our costume designer had to find something for me to, to fit in for that actor. And because I had been there throughout the entire rehearsal process, I ended up having to go on for that actor because they played the flasher and a couple other important roles in that show. Fortunately, the actor did end up showing up and he continued on with the rest of the show. But that, again, I had zero theater experience going into that and it was insane. But I also kind of felt like I had knew the whole show, bec well, because I did, because I had been there throughout the entire rehearsal process. And the other two pictures on the slide are just some other pictures of me in my blacks and uh, the hairspray can from when Edna comes out at the very end of the show. Um, so that was kind of all of my first show in <laughs> and how I got started in the stage management realm. And on the next slide, I have a um, picture of 12 Angry Jurors. This was the first show that I was the main stage manager for at El Camino. And uh, it was my first show doing theater in the round. Doing a show in the round was one of the hardest things I had to do. And that was mainly for blocking purposes. Um, there were many times where the actors would have to go to a specific point. And in my blocking book, I had to make sure that I always sat on the same side of the room when we recorded our blocking, because otherwise my blocking would be in different spaces. And it, I learned the hard way that I had to sit in the same side of the room when I was recording blocking for that show. But both of these experiences at my community college, I felt really helped me for my journey here at Dominguez Hills. And on the next slide, I have uh, whew, The Last Days of Judas Iscariot. This show was uh, directed by Kelly Herman here at uh, Dominguez Hills. And here at this, uh, during this show, uh, this was one of the shows that was unfortunately closed down due to COVID. And uh, this was one of the shows that was we were in tech week, we were about to start our tech week and unfortunately we had to, the whole school shut down. I mean, the whole world truthfully shut down, but we were so close to opening that show. We went from having to possibly 12 performances to none. 
and we were working so hard. This was also the largest show that I have had to, um, I've had the pleasure of stage managing for. There were 16 actors in this show, and uh, the largest cast that I had previously stage managed for was uh, 12, for 12 Angry Jurors. And so, uh, uh, something that was very interesting about this show in particular was the fact that it was also theater in the round, but it was with 16 uh, actors, and each actors had their entrances and exits. In my previous show, 12 Angry Jurors, everybody was on stage the entire time. In this show, there were lots of different entrances and exits and all of these different lighting cues. This entire show was so massive. There was so much work that all of us, excuse me, had put into this show. And to not see it come alive was so devastating. Um, so the two photos I have here, um, I have uh, my sign-in sheet for all of my actors. And then in the photo on the other side, I have my blocking. This show in particular, I had to do my blocking a little bit differently. And that's something that I've kind of learned throughout my stage management journey is that every show that I have done is different. I've done my blocking differently for every show because each show kind of requires its own thing. And so in, in this particular script, I have uh, kind of just little blocked out squares and just, I had to draw out their blocking because there were so many movements throughout all of the different actors and there were lots of actors um, just countering each other at the same time. And for my brain, I had to just draw the pictures and that was the best way that I was able to understand it. On the next slide, I have pictures of kind of another place where I got to go on my stage management journey, which is through uh, the city of Carson. I am um, a recreation assistant for the city of Carson. And we have, uh, I've had the pleasure of stage managing for them uh, twice. Um, we did shows uh, both here in the university theater um, we had done Aladdin Jr. and uh, The Lion King Jr. Um, a couple of the last summers that just passed, not 2020, but in 2019 and 2018, we had done those productions here in the UT. And something that I learned through this experience is that, uh, yeah, stage managing adults is a lot different than stage managing children. And I mean that in the best way, but there is a large difference. Um, but there are also some similarities. A lot of the times you have, uh, one of the similarities was between the children and the actors, what is my locking? And therefore I would have to tell them the same thing. So there was some similarities, which I fortunately was able to bring to the table, but there was also some differences and just maturity levels and all of the different things. Um, but I'm, I was fortunate enough that with my prior stage management experience that I was able to bring that to the stage. And then lastly, on the next slide, I, uh, through my stage management experience here at Dominguez Hills, I have had the opportunity to work in the professional world for two weeks. I was able to be a production assistant at the Mark Taper Forum for a uh, touring Broadway show titled uh, What the Constitution Means to Me. And I got to work closely with the stage management and I was able to do just all of these different things. I ran lines with uh, some of the actors at certain points and I got to do all of these fun little things. But I ha would not have had that experience had I not come to Dominguez Hills. And so lastly, what I would like to say is that for my future, I felt because of my experience at El Camino and Dominguez Hills that I'm ready to take on anything because I feel like I've been prepped for what the rest of the world has to give me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alodra Caviedes and I'll be pre presenting my senior project in the uh, design track. 
Um, so it all started when I was a college freshman here at Dominguez Hills. Um, I started as a math major, right? Uh, just like anybody else. And well, I was in an introduction to speaking class and I got an extra credit opportunity to paint doors. I took the opportunity and well, I actually volunteered to be quite a different, <laughs> I, I followed a different track, so to speak. Well, um, during that time, I got to know a lot about props and lighting. Um, we actually have a slide here that is um, presenting the hog light board that I actually presented on, um, operated on, my apologies. And uh, I also had to work with props, but it was more about the dishwashing stage of it. And well, when I got here, I, got, I found my passion and I found my family. Next slide, please. <laughs> so this is uh, when I became a double major and I added theater as a, a second major. I was reluctant at first because I wanted to be a minor and, you know, try it out. <laughs> Eventually, I overcame the fear and decided to major in both theater and mathematics. And well, this is something that a conversation that you might see um, ha uh, somebody with having conversation with me. Next slide, please. <laughs> All right, so lighting and properties. It was interesting because I started off as, you know, just an operator and learning how to set cues and, you know, how things worked in the theater and like, like a little bit into production. And then finally, um, I got, you know, I just was dipping my toes at first and then I really went full in. I stepped right into the ocean and went for a swim. Um, this is really, really great time of my life because I have never regretted becoming a theater major. Um, I got a lot of experiences with trial and error, you know, having the support system here at Dominguez Hills, it, it was so important for me to create a, a bond with all the people that I've met and to learn things, even if they weren't necessarily, you know, technical, so to speak. I learned that I needed to trust people because they were on your team. Why would they not, why were they trying to sabotage you, right? I also learned that allowing others to take on a task is also okay. It's not gonna be the end of the world. This person is trying to help you. So go ahead and delegate those tasks so to speak. And well, I also got to perform, I got to uh, help produce two very important shows and very dear, near and dear to my heart, which are The Little Prince and Before It Hits Home. <laughs> they were both directed by our very own staff and faculty, Kelly Herman and Donis Leonard. Um, and each rehearsal, I remember having a little bit more of the show come alive and it was just a beautiful experience. So, next slide, please. Um, talking about lighting, we start with Little Prince. And in The Little Prince, I had to make a cue sheet. And this cue sheet was a somewhat magical experience because it, was, it made it possible for us to not have a paper tech. And if you know anything about theater, if you can cut corners, you, you, could, you de definitely want to do that. <laughs> um, next slide, please. And then this is more about Little Prince lighting. It was a little bit strange to work in the space because it was diamond oriented. It wasn't the normal setup that we're used to. And I had to assign areas in different locations. And me and the technician, we, we went through it and we were like, this, this could be, this, is, this could work. And this is what's best for what our situation allows, right? Um, and <laughs> in doing so, I had to translate a lot of the time um, what the designer wanted and then what the technician could achieve with the idea. So over here I have swirly, swirly lights as the designer explained. And well, uh, I assume the technician understood because they gave me exactly what I wanted. And the biggest thing I learned from the technician is don't look into the light means look down <laughs> because I had a lot of ouches. Next slide, please. 
And the looks that we achieved in The Little Prince were so beautiful. They sparked magic, sparked joy. And I'm really grateful that I was a part of this show. There was so many things that made this show come alive and being a part of it was so life-changing for me. Next slide. Now moving on to properties. I made two uh, Excel spreadsheets this time around. One, because I had money to deal with and um, a budget to keep in order. And also, I needed to make lists because I needed to know what do we need next? How can we make this more realistic? How can we make this come alive even more on stage? And it, before Hips Home, all the props were just so, so intimate. It made the space feel like a home, and it, did, it didn't feel like a stage any longer. Next slide, please. So one of the biggest tasks that I had to overcome was one of the scenes that required a lot of eating on stage, but none of the food was going to be eaten. So we made a game plan of like making fake food uh, as a dinner accommodation. And what happened there is quite wonderful because I learned that dishes are really noisy and you have to silence them when they're on stage because then they're a distraction. And you have to know how to improvise on the spot on things like that. You know, I had to use Velcro. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> um, uh, along with that, I also had a, a really great, amazing team behind me because I tried to cook corners where I could because I knew the budget I had. And so when I had all the table covers and the napkins, they weren't quite all together in one piece. And that disappointed me. And the wonderful costume department helped me, the costuming assistant helped me create the table cover and the napkins. You know, they were just a hem that needed to be made, but the difference that it made was great. Um, the last thing I want to mention is how in one of the hospital scenes, it was so interesting how white is such a drastically changing color because when we had moments where there was too much un 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 unfocused attention on something like a chair, a magazine, right, to make this office, this doctor's office come alive. We had to spray paint it with black spray paint because the lights would hit it and all of a sudden we'd look at the magazines, we'd be focused on the pretty pictures instead of what's going on in front of you. So it was just fascinating. Every little trick that you learned made you become more successful every single rehearsal after that. Next slide, please. This home environment was so deep because not only did I become a prop manager, I was also loved and cared for by the crew. They listened to me when I was having a bad time. I had a crink in my neck and one of the actors gave me a massage on my shoulder. I was in pain. I couldn't even turn my neck. It was terrible. But there they were, my family ready to help me. Next slide, please. Thank you for listening. Just remember one more thing. Once a Toro, always a Toro. Thank you.